Hey friends and welcome back. My name is Khaled and in this video we're going to talk about the CCS cases portion of the USMLE Step 3 exam. They can be very intimidating, especially because we've never really seen anything like this back in Step 1 and Step 2. For those unaware, CCS cases are pretty much just computer-based simulations of patients. And the idea behind them is to see if you have a good approach to common cases that you're likely to see during intern year. To preface this, I would first like to thank ccscases.com for allowing me permission to use their two free cases as examples in the latter half of this video. I would also like to clearly state that I am not being paid or sponsored by ccscases.com. I personally am promoting this resource because I used it and I found it to be very beneficial. This video will be broken down into two halves. The first half of this video is going to deal with my general approach to cases, what I'm trying to pay attention to, and just giving you some tips on how I'm keeping everything organized. The latter half of this video is going to focus on the two free examples and I'll show you a live demonstration of how I'm tackling these cases. Let me give some quick facts about the cases. Every case is either 20 minutes long or 10 minutes long and that is considered real time. In other words, you have 10 real minutes in our world to solve this case. Another case could be 20 minutes long which means that you would have 20 minutes of real time to solve this case. There is another time being taken into consideration, which is known as simulated time. This is the time in the simulated patient's world. For example, right now, the time might be 12 p.m. when you're taking the test. So 12.20, you have to finish the case. But in the actual case, as soon as you start on 12 p.m., the patient might be coming into the clinic at 9 a.m. And you can fast forward in just pretty much a few clicks right into 10 a.m., 11 a.m., 12 p.m., so on. You can even skip up to a week, two weeks, three weeks. It depends on the case, but bear in mind, I'll be using these two different terms. Whenever I say real time, I mean my actual time to finish the case. Whenever I say simulated time, for example, oh, I'm gonna simulate one week in advance, or so on, I mean the actual simulated patient's world. So what's gonna be our main approach? Well, every case is gonna start with a dialog box that first gives you history, and it's going to be quite comprehensive, so you wanna skim for certain things. The things that you wanna look for are age, gender, allergies, a brief skim of the history and what they're presenting with, and lastly, you wanna check what screening or vaccines they have been doing. All those are gonna be important for later as you're gonna see. And I would personally write these five things down onto my scratch sheet in order to make sure that I have them on hand whenever I need them. Out of these five, I wanna talk currently about one, which is the skimming the history part. Now what you're gonna notice, especially with the cases we're gonna do, they give a lot of buzzwords. And the idea is they don't wanna trick you. They're openly telling you, hey, by the way, this is the diagnosis. But even with you knowing the diagnosis, we wanna see your approach. We wanna see how you're able to reach this diagnosis and how you're able to set up a proper differential and rule them out in order to reach your diagnosis. For example, you're gonna see that one of the cases is gonna talk about right upper quadrant pain that's exacerbated by fatty food. This is clearly trying to tell you, hey, I have gallstones. But it's not enough for you to just put in orders for gallstones. Instead, you have to put in orders for other diseases as well. For example, you need to rule out pancreatic or other abdominal disorders. So the whole idea is that, hey, we're not making this tricky. We're letting you kind of know what the diagnosis is and so on and so forth. We're giving you the buzzwords, but show us a good approach. Show us what tests you're gonna order in order to rule out the possible differentials. After you close that dialog box and get those five things, you're gonna wanna see the vitals, which will be the immediate screen afterwards. And from there, you make a decision. Do you wanna do a complete physical examination or just a focused physical examination? Now, here's how I make my own decision. If the patient is stable, coming to the clinic, not really anything too severe or life-threatening, I usually do a complete physical examination. And this will then open the dialog box showing me everything that happened, as well as push the simulated time upwards of 15 minutes possibly. If instead they're coming to the emergency department with some sort of angina, then I'm not gonna be sitting there doing a complete physical examination because it's gonna waste some of the simulated time. I'm gonna be wasting 15 minutes of simulated time and the patient is having some sort of angina, could possibly be life-threatening either aortic dissection or could be some sort of MI. And in that time, we're checking lymph nodes. So it's important to do a focused physical examination during cases like that. Now, depending on the stability of the patient, you also have two more decisions to make. Where do you want the patient to be? And do you want to make any emergency orders? In terms of disposition of the patient, where you want them to be, you have several different options. For example, if they came to the clinic, you could either send them home if it's not that serious and you're just waiting for some labs to come back. You could send them to the emergency department if they came wrongly to the clinic and uh, they're coming with something a bit too severe and you want to send them because there's something life-threatening that you're worried about. 
or you can admit them if for example they came to the emergency department and they have a fever but they ended up requiring intravenous antibiotics you can pretty much admit them so it really depends on the case how stable they are and what you believe the differential is are there is there anything that's life-threatening and uh, you know, how their labs generally are. For example, if a patient is coming who's uptunded, their glass coma scale is really, really low, um, for example, their ABGs are all, all over the place, then you might want to shift them to the ICU. If, for example, they only have a fever, um, you found out later that possibly it's meningitis and they need some intravenous antibiotics, they could go, for example, to the um, general wards. It depends on case to case, and that's something that you're going to get with practice. There's no real clear-cut rule, but with time, you actually get to learn where the patient needs to be. As for emergency orders, it depends on you. Usually, after doing a focused physical examination, because there was something that I was worried about that could be life-threatening or something that's more serious, then generally I go for my emergency orders. And these I remember with the mnemonic that was provided by some of my seniors, uh, Mavoc plus F. M is for morphine slash metoclopramide, depending on if there's any pain or nausea. Then you have your A, and I usually do ACC, and that's to get me both access to IV access as well as AccuCheck glucose to check if there's any hypoglycemia or anything like that. Then V is for vitals check. You have O for oximeter slash oxygen. And then lastly, you have C and C and F. So one C is for cardiac monitor. The other C is for C-spine, and the last one is for fluids, depending on the certain case. Usually, I give normal saline. Remember, these are not all needed, but this is just a simple mnemonic to remind you of everything. Also, one last tip before we move on. If you've ever done a focused physical examination, once you've finished your emergency orders and possibly put in some other orders as well, you want to maybe go back and finish the rest of your physical exam, just in case you've missed anything. Now comes the real work. We want to put in orders that are going to give us a lot of information and are going to be non-invasive. I modified an mnemonic given to me by my senior in order to be able to remember a lot of the tests that I usually forget. And believe me, I know how crazy it looks. It's C-C-C-M-P-C-U-A-E-H-L Lucent. And it looks crazy, but believe me, for somehow, some way, it just works. All right, so from the top, here's what every single letter signifies and how you can use this mnemonic in order to be able to remember a lot of the tests that don't really come up at first glance. CBC, CMP, creatine phosphokinase, magnesium and phosphate. Those are pretty easy. Chest x-ray, or any x-ray really, could be you know shoulder, arm, depending on what you need. Ultrasonography, depending again on what you need, could be pelvic, could be you know vaginal, could be um, abdominal and so on. Um, and then ABGs, usually for any patient with respiratory distress, and then ECG, any patient that comes with a cardiac problem or anything where you're suspecting some sort of arrhythmia. And with, with this ECG, you can also remember other kinds of cardiac tests, for example, echoes, or for example, um, cardiac enzymes, and so on. And then lastly on this line is HCG, because it's something that you're probably going to forget, and I usually do it for any female of a productive age, as a very crude rule, somewhere between 15 and 45. With the first L, you have lactate. With the second L, you have LFTs. And with LFTs, along with the you know liver, we, we go for PT, PTT, and INR. With the U, we have urine analysis, as well as other urine stuff, for example, urine culture or uh, urine toxicology screen. And then with the S, we have stool. And then C, culture. So blood cultures, and I usually do this for any patient that's coming with a fever. E is for ESR slash CRP. And then N is neurochecks for any patient with altered sensorium. And then lastly, T for TSH. So yeah, that's the mnemonic. I know it's long, I know it sounds crazy, but hey, it works. Now I don't go around doing this to all patients, but it helps to remind me some of the things that need to happen for some patients. For example, most of them get their CBC and CMP. However, I'm not gonna order lactate on every single patient. I'm not gonna order CK on every single patient. I'm not gonna order cardiac enzymes for every single patient. So really tailor these easily forgotten tests to certain patients so you don't really forget them. From there, you should likely land on a certain diagnosis, and from there, it depends on you and what you remember from your step one as well as your step two. That's gonna help you figure out the treatment as well as how you're supposed to really manage the patient with continuous uh, monitoring. And let's say for this case, for a 20 minute real time case, you manage to take up 10 minutes of the case and treat the patient perfectly. What you will notice is that the case will end early. And if you've noticed the grades on ccscases.com, what ends up happening is if you get the major, major beats and you get the major big things that you don't want to miss and you haven't done anything super wrong and your patient is improving, usually, even though you didn't absolutely, you know, solve 100% of the case according to ccscases.com, 
the case will still end early. And that is something that happens even on the real exam as well. Once the case finishes, you have two minutes always at the end, whether it's a 20 minute case or a 10 minute case. Two minutes are given to you at the end in order to put in any extra orders. These could be things like screening tests, such as colonoscopies, pap smears, mammography. Uh, these could be things that are like vaccines, shingles, uh, tetanus. These could be even things like uh, instructing your patients, so count, counseling them on certain medications that you're starting them on, counseling compliance with the medication, side effects of medications, um, counseling them for safe sex if they've gone, for example, or, or had uh, an STI during the case, um, counseling them if they, for example, have been smoking or uh, drinking. Uh, and these are all things that you should have on your scratch sheet as first hand uh, in the beginning. This is why I mentioned those five things are really important. One of them is screening that I mentioned. Uh, for example, if they've done any colonoscopies or anything. And with, under that, you can also include if they've been smokers or if they um, you know, drink alcohol excessively or if they, for example, have multiple sexual partners. All of these are things that you can put in within those five things in the beginning that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and this will make the last two minutes very, really, really just streamlined and it will be really easy for you to go through them. I personally have a mnemonic that I invented in order to keep things streamlined. Now obviously you don't need to use all of it, but use certain things that are required based on the age and gender and all those five things you have on your scratch sheet. The mnemonic goes like this, S-I-T-P-M, C-P-M, and then I, SAD. So S-I-T-P-M are meant to be your vaccines, so shingles, influenza, tetanus, pneumococcal, meningococcal, and uh, based on the case and the age and gender, you should be able to understand which ones should be given to, to who. Um, for example, shingles should be given to anyone more than 50 years of age uh, if there are no contraindications. Um, influenza should be given in the fall season and so on. Tetanus needs to be given if they didn't have their dose in the last 10 years or if they don't recall their vaccination history. Pneumococcal meningococcal would be a wonderful addition to someone, for example, who um, is, is susceptible to encapsulated organisms and so on. CPM is meant to be your screening test, so colonoscopy, pap smear, mammography. To give you a brief idea, colonoscopy, 50 to 75 years of age, uh, Q10 years. Um, then you have your pap smear, 21 to 65 years of age, Q3 years, and then your mammography, 50 to 75 years of age, Q2 years. And lastly, I sad. This is basically just instructing the patient. So the first I is an instruct. And when you put instruct into the field box, it gives you so many different options. So you're free to pretty much pick whichever ones you want. Uh, if they have diabetes, instruct them about diabetes. If they have, um, if you're giving them new medications, instruct them about compliance and side effects. Um, as well as for the three S's, that's uh, smoking, uh, safe sex, and seat belt. Lastly, A and D, A is for alcohol, uh, and that's for just abstaining alcohol if they drink excessively, and D is disease specific based on what they are coming with. So if they, uh, for example, have a psychiatric history and uh, that's kind of what the case is going for, then maybe consulting psychiatry could be a good idea. So yeah, that should pretty much give you an idea of the main approach. Now I know it still is very intimidating and probably just talking about this is not going to help, which is why we're now going to transition to the second part of this video where I'll get to show you examples so you not only hear what I'm talking about, but also get to see an example and demonstration of this live. So this is what the website looks like. You can head on over to it in the link in the description below. They have four different subscriptions. I personally use the one month one. Um, they have around 140 cases and you can finish those very easily within two weeks. They also offer two free cases, which we'll be doing today. This is the main hub where you can see all the different cases. Here we're only going to do the two free ones. You can see the different specialties, the time limit, whether it's 10 or 20 minutes, if it's completed or not, how high yield it is, and the average grade. Um, you can also get a chance to see the case title and diagnosis, but I urge you to keep them unticked so you don't burn the case for yourself. There's also a chance for you to simulate network lag, basically in the actual exam. Sometimes when you click on things during the exam, there's a little bit of a delay and you can simulate that using the software. All right, so with that said, let's go ahead and start the first case. All right, so here's case number one. It's a 41-year-old woman who's presenting to the ED with complaint of sudden loss of abdominal pain. Okay. Vitals, she's got a fever and her BMI slightly elevated. Um, all right, 41 year old woman, sudden osseous abdominal pain uh, after a large meal, radiates to the shoulder. All right, so they're pretty much telling us it's, um, you know, gallstones, uh, hyperlipidemia. All right. Now I'm pretty much looking for the screening requirements, so she could use some tetanus, maybe a pap smear as well. I don't see pap smear anywhere, so probably she's going to need it. Um, quit smoking, but she's been smoking beforehand, so maybe some counseling there. Alcohol as well. All right, now we can do our physical examination. I'm going to do a focused one because he's coming to the emergency department and it's quite uh, an e emergent setting. 
as you can see here, it's going to tell me that it's going to move the clock by five minutes. This has nothing to do with the real time. The real time is the time you do to you know, solve the case, but it's going to move uh, ahead the simulated time. All right, so here's the physical examination. As you can see, we moved up by five minutes, but our real time is still at one minute. All right, in moderate distress, and just skimming here. On the abdominal examination, it says the sonographic Murphy sign is positive. So it's pretty much telling us, hey, it's gallstones, but let's see your approach. So let's first put in some emergency orders. Let's put in morphine, metoclopramide. All right, we can also do ACC for IV access and AccuCheck glucose, vitals check. We can also do an oximeter. And we can do normal saline. All right, morphine. All right, intravenous, clopramide, intravenous, access IV, Mackie check glucose. That's why I type ACC because it shows me both in the same screen. It's quite convenient. Vitals check. You can you know choose a frequency, but I just you know put it in. Um, oximeter and normal saline. All right, there we go. And now I'm going to go back and complete the rest of my physical examination. You can only click the ones that you missed, but just to be completely thorough to make sure I didn't miss anything, I usually click on everything again. And that's going to move us up to uh, 720. All right, that's all normal. Vitals, pretty much similar to the ones we just saw. Here's the full physical examination. Mm, nothing new really, so that's fine. Alright, so now let's do our orders. Now just in case you miss anything, you can always check on the other tabs to sort of go back and see anything you may have missed. But bear in mind, as you click these tabs, you cannot order anything. To order, you have to go back to the order sheet. And in case you want to you know, just cancel anything, you just click on it in the order sheet and you can cancel it. In this case, we'll just say no. You can also move time ahead. Now bear in mind, if you ever see an abnormal result, even if you move ahead, let's say by two days, it's going to give you the opportunity to stop. So for example, if I chose um, you know, an, an oximeter, and then I moved two days ahead, and then the oximeter came up and then told me, hey, uh, this patient's oxygen side is like uh, 70%, I'll have the chance to stop simulating any additional time, go back to the orders, and add in oxygen. So don't worry too much about skipping too much time. You'll have the chance to stop in case any tests come up uh, before the date that you chose. So here I'm just following my mnemonic. Pretty much put in the pertinent orders that I want to put in. Uh, maybe also, let's say, a urine analysis and ESRCRP. Again, you want to be as succinct as you can. No need to really apply the whole mnemonic, but uh, you don't want to miss anything as well. CBC, CMP, all right, abdomen ultrasound, all right, HCG, both qualitative and quantitative, all right, okay, okay, LFTs, PT, PTT, and INR, lipid profile, urine analysis, ESR, and CRP, all right. And now um, I can actually see when the ultrasound is going to show up. So the report's going to be at 750, so we can actually just skip up to that. There we go. As you can see, it shows a star next to the abnormal results, makes it very convenient for you to actually follow them. So here she has leukocytosis, her ultrasound shows key cholecystitis. You don't have to read the whole thing, just the impression's fine. All right, so now we have a good reason to move her to the inpatient unit. And whenever she goes to the inpatient unit, you got to give her... Um, you know, a full set of orders. And, and here we really have a good excuse to give her some antibiotics as well. We can start treating her pretty much. Let's give her peptazo. Again, it's quite lenient. You don't have to, it's, it's not a very specific antibiotic, but here we're just going to give peptazo. Uh, we can also consult general surgery for uh, removing the gallstone. Uh, we can keep her MPO for the surgery. Um, give her her walking privileges, in this case, bed rest with uh, bathroom privileges and blood type and cross match for the surgery in case there's any complication. Usually there isn't, but it's a good, a good idea to show the test that you are being proactive. Also we can give um, ANCEF, or uh, cefazolam in this case, uh, as antibiotic prophylaxis for the surgery. 
Whenever you do a consultation, they're going to ask for a reason. So in this case, we can say acute cholecystitis, um, patient requires surgery. There we go. NPO, all right. Bed rest with bathroom privileges, there we go. Blood type and cross match or screening, either one works. Cephazolin, either one works, but we'll, we'll give it intravenous. All right, and then we can move up time. As you can see, we're at six minutes of real time, so we have uh, two minutes left until the two minute screen pops up. So let's just keep on going. Everything's fine here. We'll take her for surgery. All right, keep managing her. We'll do that. All right. And as you can see, patient update, she's grateful for your care. So now even though there's still two minutes left until we see the two minute screen, you're gonna see here that as soon as I press okay, the case has actually ended. And now we've skipped ahead to the final two minutes of the case. So here we can put in the last few things that we want based on the five things that we already have on our scratch sheet. In this case, smoking, alcohol, and pap smear. Also we'll put in instruct just to get that long list of instructing the patient. All right, instruct, there we go. So smoking cessation, alcohol abstention, and pap smear. And instruct, let's try and find something that could be relevant for this patient. Don't want to spend too much time here, maybe like an exercise program. Um, let's see, what else can we add here? I think for now, that's, that's pretty much it. Yeah, that feels fine. In terms of vaccines, we can give uh, tetanus. Should have probably added that in the field box before, but hey, we still have time. And we'll pick this one. There we go. And that's pretty much it. Uh, you could add more orders, but even though I have a minute here left, I'm just going to end the case. And as you can see, we did pretty well. So it gives you your score. Uh, it shows you the average score of people who did this test for the first time, gives you the final diagnosis, and gives you a nice uh, feedback screen that really tells you everything that you did well and did wrong. Even though we don't know exactly how the CCS cases are scored, this gives you a decent idea of how well you did and uh, what things you avoided. For example, here I avoided doing a CT abdomen. Treatment. We got everything. And again, this all comes with practice and everything that you learn from step one and step two. Uh, sometimes this is finicky. It tells you you were in the wrong location. Um, I was just a little delayed, possibly because I repeated certain aspects of the physical examination. Uh, again, it's sometimes just as finicky and you can't really do much about that. Then gives you a nice little summary down here. So yeah, that's case number one. All right, so case number two, a 28-year-old Caucasian male. Comes to the ED with a headache. All right, it keeps getting worse. Let's check his vitals. So he's got a really high fever. Uh, everything else feels okay. All right, progressively worsening. Uh, began two days ago, getting worse. All right, neck pain. So first off, the first thing I'm thinking of right now with all this is just meningitis. Like they make it quite, quite clear um, from the from the from just skimming the history. Let's go look for some things that we need for our last two minutes. Um, smokes. All right. Denies illicit drug use, drinks alcohol occasionally. All right. So let's do our physical examination. Let's only do the relevant ones here since this is in the emergency setting. All right. And maybe some neuro as well. This will move us up by eight minutes in simulated time. All right. Moderate distress, nuclear rigidity. Okay. Sometimes the case might be a little bit more vague. In that case, you can still adopt this approach. You don't have to know the diagnosis, you know, um, using buzzwords, but in this case, they make it very clear. So let's go and put in our emergency orders, oximeter, ACC, vitals check. All right. Oximeter. For now, I'll purposely, um, you know, leave out normal saline. Um, I won't give it at all in this case, just because I want to show you what happens if you don't do something um, in the feedback screen. And now let's go and complete our physical examination. Ideally, I should be paying attention to which ones I've already done, but it's fine. Oximeter is good. All right. If it was bad, it would give me an option um, to stop and then put on some oxygen, so just bear that in mind. In this case, it was fine. All right, so especially with the Koenig and Brudzinski signs being positive, this is definitely going to be meningitis, so let's put in our orders first. CBC, CMP, CT had to rule out possibly any um, increases in intracranial pressure. 
chest x-ray, possibly to rule out any cochrane infections. Again, a fever could be anything, so we kind of have to prove to this, you know, uh, software that, hey, we're still ruling out a differential. It's not that we're only going for meningitis. LFT, PT, INR. You can get also ESR and CRP. All right, so let's also get a lumbar puncture. And with lumbar puncture, we can also get cerebrospinal fluid. Just doing a lumbar puncture will not give you um, the studies for the CSF. Uh, this is similar to, for example, if you intubate someone, you also have to give them mechanical ventilation as a separate order. If you go for an orthosynthesis, you're going to have to use um, you know, synovial fluid as a separate order. So just bear that in mind. Uh, don't assume that by doing an orthosynthesis, you'll get associated sets of orders with it. You have to order them separately. All right, so here we're ordering them separately. CSF, we're just going to go for a lot of the different ones because, again, hey, we don't know exactly what kind of meningitis it is, so we want to keep our... Um, you know, all our bases checked. All right, let's go for those. I don't see any uh, viral PCR. It's just PCR herpes and enterovirus. So maybe we could also search that in the field box just to be 100% safe. All right, now I'm just confirming everything that I ordered on that page. There we go. Just a few more. All right, again, this patient is coming with a fever, so I kind of want to search some other things, um, possibly a urine analysis. Your intox screen. We can also search a viral culture just to make sure that we didn't miss it. All right, your toxicology, blood culture, viral culture, CSF. There we go. All right, now let's skip some time ahead. All right, opening pressure and cloud and turby. That's that's enough for me to want to put this patient into the inpatient unit. You see how it told me I can stop now. So I stopped the time. I, I didn't want to go ahead with the time that I simulated, and I stopped the time where it stopped me, and uh, I brought them into the inpatient unit. We can also consult infectious disease in case they have anything to add. Concern for meningitis. That will be our reason for consultation. Again, the consultation order is kind of finicky. Uh, sometimes, for example, a patient would need uh, cardiothoracic surgery, and they would want, they would expect you to um, consult cardiac surgery, not cardiothoracic surgery. So, it takes some time getting used to, but for the most part, uh, you should be able to get the hang of it just by practice. Let's get some antibiotics as well. I choose vancomycin, ceftriaxone, and dexamethasone. I have to remember to cancel dexamethasone based on uh, the results. So let's see what he ends up getting. So, all right, so we don't need to cancel anything as of yet. Let's check with the patient. All right, so he's feeling better. So we're definitely doing things correctly. Let's go back and see uh, if his vitals have been doing well. Yeah, his fever has gone down dramatically. All right, teens high, glucose is low. All right, they don't have any specific recommendations right now, which is fine. One important thing you can do uh, for patients that come in with fever, even though he doesn't have one now, but this is just a good learning opportunity, you can give naproxen. But if you ever choose to give naproxen, be sure to give imeprazole with it. It's better to adopt a safer approach and prescribe them together. Um, or you can go for celecoxib, and you should know from your step two and step one that it's not going to really affect anything uh, in terms of GI ulcers. We'll also counsel him on the side effects of the medications. 
now we can simulate time further. Patient update, he's fine. And there you go. Case ended early and we're at the two minute screen. So we can counsel him on smoking, alcohol, and we can give tetanus as the vaccine. Other than that, pretty much, I don't think he has anything else that we need to really worry about. All right, alcohol abstention and tetanus. We'll pick this one. There we go. And even though we have a lot of time left, um, I feel like I covered all my bases. Uh, you can always go back and check, for example, here. Uh, I'm just check, making sure that he's a 28 year old male, so I don't need to do anything like a colonoscopy or anything like that. You can also go back to the more in depth history uh, here. Yeah, there's nothing else that we can really cover. All right, so with that, we'll just end the case and see how we did. All right, so we did reasonably well. Here's the average score again. They give you the diagnosis, they give you all this feedback, and you can see we purposefully did not order any normal saline. You can see right here um, and under the treatment tab, they mentioned that you should have ordered it, you know. So again, it, it keeps in mind everything that you've been doing. And again, here's the uh, appropriate location being a little bit finicky. Uh, I could have done things a little bit better by making sure about the certain physical examinations that I was doing in order to not repeat any. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much case number two. With that, I really hope you found this video beneficial. If you did, please consider hitting the like button and subscribing to the channel to not miss any of my future content. I put a lot of time and effort into this video and really hope you find some use out of it. Also, I recently launched my Buy Me A Coffee page where you can pretty much support me to keep my content free in the best way possible by providing you with the residence fuel. Coffee! Thank you again to ccscases.com for allowing me to use these free cases in my video. And as always, thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one.